Karen Brody, welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle uh, podcast. Thank you so much for taking part in this interview today. I'm very happy to have you here, especially after reading that you uh, like salsa and you're living in Mexico. I can definitely empathize with that being British and learning salsa and coming to Spain. Um, you're a world-class man coach. And for those who are unfamiliar with this term or your work, what is a man coach? Well, I help men claim their true power and to learn to use that power in life and in their relationships with women. So it's very particular to men um, because it's all about helping to heal whatever shame men have take on, taken on around their masculinity, their sexuality, and learning to embody you know, a, a presence, a sexuality that they can feel proud of. Fantastic. So what inspired you to, to, to do this and, and why men? Well, the inspiration comes from an entire lifetime of experience mm. of um, pain, of sexual abuse. Um, I knew at some point once I did my own healing work, uh, when I was around 30 years old, well, when I began my process, it's a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. um, I knew that I wanted to help people heal sexual shame because it had been so profound for me. And um, so I was all over the map. You know, I worked with women, I worked with couples. And then ultimately, I realized that I had this gift for men. And, um, and I got divine confirmation of that at one point. It felt really sort of scary because it was the area that I really needed work. You know, we tend to do the work in which we need our most healing. And I found in working with men that not only did it heal me in my pain around men and sexual abuse, but um, I learned the way over time for what men really needed. And it wasn't me sitting down and just telling them all about how great women are. <laughs> That's initially where I started. Um, but I learned that there was wounding for men and, um, and that they needed people, resources to help them see the beauty and power in what they brought to the world. And once I started down that track, the work got really deep and profound. And it changed me in my perspective towards men entirely. Fantastic. Um, so what profile of... Um clients do you have are they single are they married are they in a relationship well that was another refinement process so I worked with single men initially and um, that had its sort of flavor of excitement but then when I, I started to uh, really refine the work I realized it was married men that I felt most inspired to work with because um, of their investment you know, men who come to me are really invested in being the best men they can be. They're invested in the love they have for their partners. And it allowed me to go a lot deeper in the work with them. And it also allowed me um, passively to give women the love that I knew that they wanted in their relationships. Oh, fantastic. So married men are my guys. Well, that's interesting. So is, it, is that something that they think them is are they inspired themselves to go to you? Or is that something that their wives kind of is it? Who, do you know whose idea it is, or is it just does it just depend from case to case? Is it usually something that that's a part of couples therapy, or is it the wife's idea, the man's idea? On occasion, um, women who follow me will suggest to their partners that they work with me, but generally, it's men trying to do it on their own because that's what men do. So they start with some research. Um, they try out a few different things on their own and then they realize it's somehow not working and they reach out to me. Um, sometimes it's also that they have been to therapy with their partners and the therapy just never touched on what was most important to them and that was healing their own sexuality or healing the sexual relationship. So they too come to me. So I guess sexuality is the main issue then I suppose with your clients. Is that true, do you think? It is the main issue. It's, it's like the gateway, mm -hmm. but as we work together and I get to know them better, it's often not just about sex, but that's uh, frequently where men start. That's where they're experiencing the most pain and the, 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 the most confusion. 
Okay, because I think that people think that men just think about sex on a physiological um, aspect, but I think it goes way deeper. I think even lots of male sexual behavior is more emotional than, than what we give them credit for. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, and that's the most important thing I learned about men and the most healing thing for me, because like most women, I was educated by my mother and grandmother to believe that men only cared about that one thing. And it was very painful for me because I was an ideal idealist, you know, as, as a girl. And when my mother told me that men couldn't be trusted because they were only after one thing, I don't think she realized um, how profoundly that would damage my sense of men because it sets us up, it sets us up not to trust them. Mm. And so, yes, what I discovered is that men are about so much more than that because they use sex as a gateway to their hearts. And so they often can't articulate why it's so important to them. And I help them do that. But it has to do with this sense of feeling um, that they belong with a woman, um, that a woman opening herself to a man sexually says, I trust you. I love you, I honor you. And um, when that invitation isn't there, a man feels desperate, lost, um, like he has somehow failed um, to give his gift to his woman. So how important is sex in a relationship? Well, we have to go into a lot here, you know, mm -hmm. when, we, when we talk about that question. Um, I love this question, though, and I've been exploring it throughout this entire time of working with men, because it comes up a lot in the way that I hold it, in the way that I coach men, um, in the way I want to encourage them to hold their sexuality. And this is what I've come to know, is it's only important when we make it important. And so one of the ways that we make it important is through our unspoken agreements. So one of those most important agreements is marriage. Now, most people will tell you, unless they're really conscious, that they never talked about a sexual agreement before they got married. And yet, you know that most people in their hearts believe that when you marry, um, part of that is being sexual partners. And part of that is being um, exclusive for each other sexually. Mm -hmm even though most people don't talk about that piece of it either. They don't talk about why are we choosing monogamy? Why are we choosing to be exclusive to each other? Why is sex important in our relationship? And there are just all of these assumptions. And so when, um, when sex wanes, most couples don't know what to do because they don't have an agreement that they can sort of land on. When we have an agreement that's conscious, that's verbal, we can call each other back into the sexual relationship, right? We can say, hey, did you forget, you know, this commitment we have to each other? Because it's assumed and it's unspoken, nobody knows what to do about it and nobody knows what to say about it. And yet it lives there as a very meaningful expectation. And therefore, if the expectation is there, on one side or the other, it is important because without it, then the person who is not getting the sex that they want feels like somehow they've been tricked. Like this agreement that they made, whether spoken or not, has been violated. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely, it's a, it's a really difficult situation. I've been in that situation on, on both sides. Um, for example, the side where I was the one wanting more sex and feeling desired, et cetera. And, and then I've been on the other side where I felt pressure to, to be available all the time. And I think there's also a lot of pressure that that's, sex ends, ends with penetration or is defined by penetration. When someone is giving you a massage and you think, I, I want the massage, but I don't want the sex. <laughs> you see what I mean? So, so I think it's really difficult um, to, to, to have, have the pressure of being available as well. That, I, think that, I think that's a really difficult situation. Also, I think relationships go through different phases. Sometimes you're not as sexual as other times. You might be going through some some really tough experience, which might not make you feel very sexual. But I would say to people who follow me that to keep, to maintain the, the intimacy, at least, you know, the kind of the hugs and the kisses and, and that side and the massage is like the physical closeness, not necessarily sexual, it doesn't have to be sexual all the time. 
So yeah, I know, I know what it's like. Um, so do you think sexless relationships are, are doomed? Essentially, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> unless the people are, um, unless they're conscious and loving with each other and they can presence this fact and make a different agreement, I think the big issue is that let's let's take women shutting it down because that's more common, right? It's not always that way, but it's more common. So let's say the woman shuts it down. And this is very common with my clients, partners. And they say, you know, essentially, I just don't want sex anymore. And I, I don't desire it. They may be going through menopause. They may not. Mm -hmm. And um, most of those women still hold the expectation that their partners should be faithful to them, um, which I find to be really interesting. Now, I think we change and therefore our agreements need to change, right? If we're alive in our relationships, if we're alive in love. Um, but it's interesting to me how the woman might know that this agreement was part of being a married couple and yet she's saying I'm done with that and still holds this expectation that he be true to her. This is where I think it could work if they open themselves to what could be a different arrangement if we actually still want to be in relationship because there are pieces of our lives that we love together um, but oftentimes it's not that way and then what this creates is a man who feels like a failure Right. And what happens when a man feels like a failure in a relationship to a woman? He just withdraws, he gets depressed, um, he may become aggressive. It's just not pretty and it's not loving to not consider, you know, how to negotiate this new change. Yeah, it really does affect your self-esteem. And I could see that with my last partner where he was the one kind of expecting more sex. <laughs> and, um, and I could see that that was hurting him. But at the same time, I just didn't want to do something I wasn't really into. So it's a very difficult situation to be in. And also, um, there are so many other things in a relationship, like, for, for example, just the how are you every morning, the messages and this, the support. And you think, is it is the sex kind of how important is it? I think it's different. I think it does raise a lot of questions so do you think sometimes that polyamory could be an option or because that's also can be a quite dangerous for some couples do you think definitely yeah. i think it could be an option if it can work for both people in that couple and i think it has its challenges mm -hmm. when two people are sexual it, it definitely has its challenges because they're they're constantly introducing a new element um that person is a complex being, right? That they're inviting into their lives. And that complex being also has needs. Um, but if a couple isn't sexual together and they can contract this in a way that feels safe to each of them, I think it could work. But I, I notice very few people are open to that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of an opening Pandora's box. But do you give tips to men about how to seduce their wives again and try and he bring some passion back into the relationship do you have any any tips about that i think that's probably a big big issue for so many people i definitely do and it usually has to do with the man reclaiming his own power and space mm -hmm. so generally when sexual desire wanes it's because of uh, the, the proximity that they have to each other there's no space there's no freedom really um the creative energy just sort of dies between them i mean when, when we're turned on it's because of what we're creating together the newness the sense of adventure the what might be right and if we don't maintain that throughout the years we're not going to have a very sexy sex life it's going to get really boring mm. and so i teach men how to claim their own space um how to claim a power that's aligned with love, which is around self-respect, self-honoring, expressing boundaries that are powerful. Um, all of these things speak to a woman um, that she's with a man who's, um, who's a prize essentially, right? <laughs> Definitely. Um, yeah, who, um, who really values who he is and what he brings. And a lot of men get lost in that, especially when 
uh, they have so much responsibility around caring for the partners or their children, they lose sense of themselves. Um, and this is where the sexiness gets lost. When we're first attracted to a man, he's free, right? Um, it's, it's almost like trying to capture an eagle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eagleness to him, a spaciousness to him, and, and we, and we want to grab onto him. But after a while, a lot of guys that I work with become like little parakeets. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. And, and it's because they're tired. It's because um, they're just essentially trying to get through all the things they need to get through. Uh, maybe the sex isn't abundant in their relationships, so they don't have a lot of energy or inspiration. And, um, and maybe they're with a woman who's unhappy and who's complaining a lot. And they're just trying to essentially give her what she wants, you know, to make her happy. All of those behaviors, of course, kill attraction. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. I really enjoyed your book, Open Her, because on this podcast, I'm making sure I read all the books from my from my guests. And it's interesting because um, I don't think it, I don't think I'm the target reader as, as a woman, but I, I do. I did really enjoy it. And um, here it says, activate seven masculine powers to arouse your woman's love and desire. So I really loved the um, archetypes of the men here. It was really, really interesting to read. I especially love the first part of each chapter with your experience with someone who was of, of that archetype. I really loved it. And there's some things that really resonated with me with my own experience with men. For example, in the seven archetypes, you talk about the, the artist, the poet, the director, the warrior, the sage, the dark knight, and the lover. With reference to the artist, I really loved that. Um, the whole, the whole, it really made me think about really seeing someone's inner beauty it does sound like a cliche but um i think some men just them um, can only look at a woman on a, on a physical level and i remember when i was at university i used to get a lot of male attention but um some people used to say to me that i was good looking but i was weird and i thought but my weirdness is is the real beauty you know so that's when someone notices my weirdness and accepts me and uh you know when i'm wearing no makeup and i'm just in my sweatpants and a hoodie that's that's what I like, you know. When someone sees me like that, and they still find me attractive, or just my strange ways, because I've never been a conventional person, and I really love when someone can see through the, this the superficial, just the this, the uh, the physical. And I remember once I told this to a guy that I like to be observed, and he just stared at me. <laughs> he didn't quite understand. <laughs> but I think everyone, women like to be seen. I think you're so right with that, with with the artist. And then another um, archetype that I found interesting was the director a man taking charge of the situation and it made me think about do you think um i think men i mean obviously you've been doing this is it right for 14 years now is that correct you've been a, a man coach i think it's been more like 20 oh right okay i might have read that somewhere online so 20 years i mean so in that time we've had the the me too uh, movement so I, I must i must ima imagine i imagine that that's really made men very confused about taking the lead what what do you think has it affected your your work or do you think men are more confused now you know because i'm working with married men not as much so but the conversation during that did come up several times and it was really meaningful for me because the way that i was seeing is that women were finally coming forward in their deepest pain mm, you know, definitely who had held on to being abused, um, sexually harassed or sexually, uh, sexually abused for you know many years. And so to me, it felt like an opportunity to cleanse, to move into a space where there was less of this friction between men and women. But men saw it differently. And I think the reason they saw it differently is because they are so wounded. So, um, when I saw a lot of anger coming up from men on social media around this, you know, they were saying, for example, can't even look at a woman, you know, much less ask her out to lunch or anything like that. You'll be arrested. You'll be put in jail. Um, I started thinking, wow, what a great way to hijack the conversation and make it about men. Um, so initially it felt really bad to me and I started engaging on the topic with my clients. And what I came to realize is that it's because of this wound, it's because of this masculine wound. Men are already at this point, like up to here where they're feeling like 
We don't know where we belong anymore. Um, we don't know what is expected from us in the world uh, alongside women. Our, world, our roles are being diminished. Our roles are being um, eliminated essentially and women are taking over the world. And there's this sense of being lost for some men, particularly really young men. And so I realized the anger was coming out of that place because it was like, okay, well, here's another thing, right? Don't even talk to women because that becomes a, a potential for um, incrimination. Yeah, but, harassment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think what's sad is, you know, what I hoped that men would do as a coach for men is that they would come forward and stand behind us. Yeah, because I think a lot of men have probably been victims of abuse as well, I'm sure, you know, so. And also, I think it's confusing. Maybe you can empathize with this living in Mexico. Here in Spain, at least, compared to the UK, there's a lot more, let's say, wolf whistles or compliments in the street compared to where I'm from. And I guess in, in my experience of Latin countries as well, and I think from speaking to men about that, they don't understand how that's offensive to some women. Because I mean, it, as a woman walking down the street, it can be really intimidating when you see a group of guys and they're all whistling at you or saying things, whereas for them, they have a good intention. They want to kind of boost someone's confidence and they just don't get it. It's just, it's really strange. Mm. Yeah, you think, um... I think it's complex. I think for one, men don't understand women's fear. Mm. Oh yeah, absolutely. But the fear of walking home alone, they don't have that the same as women do or trying to get a taxi home, not, not, not getting a bus, you know, when you go out at night. Or getting the messages all of your life to be careful. Don't walk by yourself. Men only want one thing. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of girls being raped at university. Um, so lots of fears around women being sexually free, mm -hmm. but at the same time, one of the reasons I say it's complex is I also want to celebrate men feeling that they can express what they feel toward women sexually if it doesn't harm them, right? So um, the men you're talking about on the street are appreciating you, right? But it's interesting that if a woman has been harmed or if she does feel fear, it can feel very threatening to her. Um, so we've got this confluence of the two energies and, and it's, it's complicated. But I think you know, men could do well to just be a little more sensitive to the fact that women do have these fears of being um, physically harmed or something of that nature. Um, but that we don't want them to completely shut off their expression of a desire for us. I think there's a big difference between sexually harassing somebody and expressing your appreciation for her attractiveness. And I think when men start to say things like, now we can't approach women at all, um, they're really missing an opportunity to refine the way that they hold women, right? They're just shutting it all down and saying we just can't approach women now. Makes yeah, sense. definitely. I think there's also a lot of women who are hurt as well, so they're ex extra sensitive to it. And for me, I just feel like I'm a, I'm a survivor as well, but I, I think me too kind of really helped me heal a bit. I used to kind of ignore things like that in the news, but then it got to a point where you couldn't anymore because there were so many stories everywhere. You know, and they did, did kind of help with them. You just realized that everyone has gone through something, some type of abuse or harassment in their lives. It shouldn't be normal uh, as it has been. And another archetype that I thought was very interesting is um, the Dark Knight. Um, because I, I don't know if you've seen this series called, uh, what's it called again? Sex Life on, on Netflix. It's yeah. about a, a married woman who was married to this really nice guy, but she's, it's actually based on a, on a real story. And she's having all these sexual fantasies about her ex-boyfriend who was a bad boy and he left her when she needed him. And he's a really bad boy and, and he's, he's quite manipulative. He comes back into her life trying to seduce her. So she's having all these, you know, um, situations with, you know, the nice house, the husband and the kids, and then all these fantasies about this bad boy. So I was thinking, why do women, um, why are they attracted to these guys? And I was actually Googling it. Why do women like bad boys? And, and the answer was in some psychological magazine, they felt protected by them. <laughs> what, what would you say about that? I think, I think um, 
I don't know, it's, it's quite difficult. I think bad boys might be for when you're not looking for a relationship, but we do get kind of caught up with that. Uh, I could see how there would be moments where you're with a bad guy and you might feel protective because he is such a badass. But I think um, more often it's because you don't feel safe with him. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and because uh, there's an edge to him that's mysterious and even feels a little bit dangerous, right? That gets the sexual juices flowing. And you have to consider that our deepest desire as women is to surrender and to be taken, right? You can't surrender to somebody who's asking you for directions. You can't surrender to someone who's asking you for permission. Uh, you can't surrender to a man who's not present, who's not secure within himself. So one of the beauties of the bad boy is he has this confidence that he can take you and he will. <laughs> and most women find that to be thrilling. Will they get their emotional security needs met with this guy? Most likely not. But, um, but he does light that fire sexually. And that's why women fantasize about him. Fantastic. <laughs> um, another thing, you offer a course called Restoring the Sword. What is restoring the sword? And what leads to a weak sword? It's interesting because the word sword is actually linked to vagina. Vagina at, at its root means sword sheath. So that's interesting. So tell us about this. What is uh, restoring the sword? Well, I designed that course for men who wanted to learn how to restore their sexual power, mm -hmm. who wanted to figure out what went wrong here. You know, where did I lose myself? Where did I lose that edge? Um, uh, and so the course teaches men, you know, all the things they do unknowingly to give away sexual power. It teaches them how to heal sexual shame which I find is a huge piece of this whole equation in which a woman starts to resist lovemaking and a man backs up uh, and he keeps backing up. And as he keeps backing up, this chasm between them gets larger and larger. I have found through all these years of working with men that that's related to sexual shame. So one of my greatest joys is teaching men to overcome and heal this sexual shame because they become just so embodied sexually and there is nothing more attractive than a sexually embodied man a man who feels um, no shame he makes no apologies for the fact that he's sexual um, and this doesn't mean that he's reckless or disrespectful or dishonoring with his sexuality it means that he really holds it in a sacred way and so that's probably the biggest piece of the course is teaching men to, to change their whole mindset around how they see themselves sexually the reason a man stays with a woman for many years who won't make love to him and who offers him no other options, as we were talking about earlier, is shame. Because somehow in his mind, he was brainwashed to believe there's something wrong with his desire or else he would find another experience, another opening. So that's a big piece of the course. Um, part of it is teaching men to understand women's sexual language you know, what, really, what we really mean in the things that we say, what our actions uh, speak to, um, how to hold a woman emotionally so that you can open her sexually. It's actually a really complex course. And it's just four classes, but we go very deep. Fantastic. Um, let me think what else we got. Um, So let's see some quick questions. What is the book that changed your life? Do you have a book that's inspired you a lot? In you mean life? in my work? Yeah, or anything that in, in your healing or discovery or in your work? Well, in my work, it would be uh, David Data's Way of the Superior Man. Oh, wow. I've heard of it. I've not read it. Oh, really? Yeah. So I was in uh, Marin County, California a long time ago. Uh, it has to be 23 years ago or something, maybe 30. 
I have no sense of time. It was a long, long time ago. And in this alternative bookstore, there was David Data's book, Unbound. It was just like a, um, it looked like a dissertation clipped together. And it was really interesting that they were selling it that way. But I looked at it and I saw the title and I immediately knew I have to read this book because I had already been sensing that my work would, would go in that direction. My life would go in that direction. And so I picked up this book and um, I just devoured it. It was so beautiful to me um, because it spoke to everything I ever wanted as a woman from a man. And what I knew was possible between a man and a woman. And um, it had this effect even of healing me because it showed me that not all men are untrustworthy. Um, not all men are out to harm women, et cetera. And so it opened, it opened this whole new world for me. And I guess being a woman with your work, you, you thought that was, um, there's a real need for that as well, like a woman communicating to a man. I guess there's an extra element of, of power there or connection. Or potential. And how, you said how a woman can. Uh, for example, the David Data book is obviously a man speaking to men. So I guess with your work being a woman, I guess that that gives an, another kind of realm of power, you know, or, or empathy to them because because you kind of can give them a female perspective. I, I, I must that must be very powerful as well in your work. It is, and you know, um, there were a lot of people before the book came out, Open Her who said men are never going to read this book and especially in that it has been written by a woman and so I had no idea how it would land. I'm not aware of another woman who had a book like mine before mine. I know there are women who, women who have emerged since then mm -hmm. but at the time it felt really risky you know. Um, I was concerned that women were going to be upset with me for sort of sharing the secrets mm -hmm. <laughs> and and that men uh, wouldn't take it seriously because I'm not a man. But I think you're right. Um, I think what men were able to glean and feel was, ah, finally, like, we're inside a woman's head and body, right? And through these stories, they're able to feel the kind of effect a man can have on a woman, which is something it's, it's hard to feel when you're the one being the effector, right? Mm -hmm. um, just as for us, like we don't, um, we're not aware of or realize the effect we're having on men entirely because we're not men. Mm. But to hear that from a man would be exciting as well. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see what else. So, do you have a phrase or quotation or affirmation that you live by? Personally? Yeah. Uh, not really, but I can tell you that um, I live to realize potential in myself and others. Um, essentially, I believe that if we can see it and we can hold it in our hearts, that we can create it. Oh, fantastic. So if there's a mantra, it would be that one. <laughs> Great. Um, let me see what else. So where can people find you? Well, you can go to my website, you know, if you're interested in um, getting my free book, which is called Reignite Her Passion. In this book, I, I include three huge mistakes that men make that are invisible to them in relationships with a woman that kills sexual attraction. Men tell me this has changed their lives and it's based on the many years of coaching men. You can also find out about my coaching on that page, karenbrodycoaching.com. And then you can also go to Amazon to get Open Her, Activate Seven Masculine Powers to Arouse Your Woman's Love and Desire. Fantastic, so you do one-to-one -one coaching and then do you have some courses? Are they with you personally or are they, are they videos? Um, the course that I have right now is just the Restoring the Sword course, and I'm about to release other courses soon. Um, and that too can be found on my website. Fantastic. Okay. 
So Karen Brody, thank you so much for joining me today. We've got lots of interesting tips. I'm going to check out your, your new book. Is it Igniting Her? Is that correct? Reignite Her Reignite. Passion. A reignite her passion. That sounds perfect for the kind of men who want to seduce their wives, I suppose. Thank Fantastic. you, Lisa. Okay, thank you so much. And I'll let you know when this comes out. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye.